as we will see two different destinations for everyone to have ever existed. Uh, those that have existed are existing now, living today, and depending on how long the Lord tarries before he comes back, those from uh, years into the future from now, right? So we see the two destinations. We see either those of the first resurrection or we see those of the second resurrection. The first resurrection, they are seen to come back, the saints, that would be us of the church. We come back with the Lord, reign and rule with him in that thousand year reign. And then we go on um, to spend eternity with him. The second resurrection are those that are brought back to life, but brought back to face that final judgment of the great white throne. And it's not a, not a great sight. Um, but I think it's important, again, just to revisit that briefly, the service of contrast, because tonight we will be going over heaven, the new heaven and new earth, what our great hope is, where we will spend... Um, as believers, as followers of Christ, where we'll spend eternity, right? It's such a really cool chapter to look through and check out. So before we do that, I just want to again revisit, as it says in chapter 20, the great white throne says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds, Verse 13 of chapter 20, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And we'll see here that in chapter 21 says that in the new heaven and new earth that there no longer is any sea. It's an important and interesting detail to note. It says, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Again, that, that final judgment. Chapter 21, there is no pause. It follows immediately. Um, so ignore the chapter break there, but immediately launches in to chapter 21 here, and immediately we see a new heaven and new earth. So as always, uh, we'll go ahead and read through the scripture tonight. We'll go ahead and read through just uh, the first eight verses. And we'll go ahead and open a prayer, and then we'll dive in. So chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Verse 4, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning, or crying, or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Verse 8, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Right, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessing it gives us. We thank you for, uh, again, this has been stated many times and accurately and rightfully so, the blessing that comes with the reading and studying of this book, even specifically of Revelation, um, as we seek to understand your final revelation, that 
you gave to the Apostle John. And it's such an awesome passage tonight as we see our final destination where we spend eternity uh, with you. So Lord, we thank you uh, for this chance again to come together as a body, not forsaking that assembly. I uh, pray that your Holy Spirit guides tonight as we dig into this word. We just praise in your name. Amen. All right, so verse 1, go ahead and start again, and we'll dive in. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So again, uh, we see here the idea already and um, following chapter 20 of that millennial reign, land reign here on this earth, immediately just God does away with it and he creates a brand new heaven and a brand new earth, right? It says in Isaiah 65, 17 to 18, it says, Before behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. So again, he creates a new heavens, new earth. That word create, it's the same word that's used in Genesis chapter 1, where at the beginning of creation, where God created the heavens and the earth, right? So it's the idea of that word bara, where God, and it being an action that only God can do, right? When we create something in this world here, we can't come up with the materials just out of thin air. We have to use what's given to us, what's in front of us, whatever material that might be, wood, metal, whatever that is that we mine the earth for, we have to use those materials. God can come up with it from nothing, all right? So again, as the same idea from Genesis chapter 1, that he created something out of nothing, we see here the exact same thing in Revelation 21, that God created a new heaven and a new earth out of nothing, all right? It's important to note there. So again, something only God could create. This isn't a reformed world as some people, again, we discussed the different, uh, different views of Revelation chapter 20 and the idea of post-millennialism, post-millennialism, um, and uh, pre-mill, right? We talked about those and the consequences of those different viewpoints of that chapter and how it leads a Christian to lead their life. They're either believing that it is our job to Christianize the world and that the world will keep getting better and better and improving and start to turn more and more to God and that will usher in the kingdom and that will usher in uh, new heaven, new earth and all those things and God will return and Christ will come back. Or you hold to was would be seen as a more literal translation in that pre mill um, viewpoint where you believe that there is no Christianizing the earth, that this world is marred by sin, and there is not much hope for this earth here. You believe that, as it states here at the beginning of this chapter, that God will come back will have that thousand year reign and at the end of it there will be a new heaven and a new earth all right in that meantime we cannot christianize the world but we can still spread the gospel to more and more those that we come into contact with so that those people can as well um, experience this great reality that we're about to discuss here in chapter 21 so again, it's not a reformed world, it's a totally new world. And it says that there's no longer any sea. That's an interesting detail. I, I would not personally be able to definitively say the reason as to why there's no sea in this new heaven and new earth. Uh, I've heard some commentate and say, just referring back to chapter 20, 
verse 13, where it says that the sea gave up the dead, which were in it, and giving them for that final judgment. I've heard some say as well, you know, that so there's no longer any sea, there's no longer anywhere for people to get lost at sea. And it's just, I guess the idea, carry on the idea that there's no grave, that there's no uh, graveyard here in this new heaven and new earth, that death has been defeated at this point, right? So it says, verse 2, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. So again, that really, for, I feel like I can say this now because now I'm married. Um, it brings about that image and that idea for, for, for those that, um, of us that have to, had the privilege and the gift to be able to, to be married and for specifically the man as he's sitting up there, standing up there rather, on the stage waiting for the bride to arrive and you see the doors open up in the back of the sanctuary and you see her up here and that it's just that beautiful moment that you've just been waiting for how excited, how thrilled, how much joy that you feel for your bride right, it's that same idea here the Bible refers to the church as the bride of Christ and that's how God feels about his church and that's something that we'll even dig into a bit more in these following verses Began so the maid ready as a bride adorned for her husband verse 3 and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying behold the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them so again right here we see this idea presented to us of true deep communion with God something that we cannot experience at this point but we have that promise that we will right we, we know that sin because of sin that there is a division right there that is broken now when we come to Christ that that dividing wall is torn down and in we are covered in God's eyes in the blood of Christ and that sacrifice that we owe for our sins, for our consequences for our sins, that massive penalty that we can never repay, as a result of that, we can freely go to God. Right? We see um, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, that idea of being able to as a result of the work of the great high priest Christ, that he passed through the heavens as that high priest, great high priest, right? Again, calling back to the idea that we see in the Old Testament, which we'll be reading here sometime, I think, within the next couple months, if you're following along with our Bible reading plan here at the church. We're in the midst of Genesis right now, but when we get to the book of Exodus, we will see presented to us this idea of the temple and the holy of holies, right? The great high priest and their duty as that, uh, that high priest rather, uh, and their duty to uh, present the sacrifices on behalf of the people so that their sins could be forgiven, right? But the person of Christ, he takes care of that. He is the great high priest. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews tells us that he is the great high priest, that he is the better sacrifice, the better priest. He, he's the better covenant. He's the better of all of that. All these things that we see in the Old Testament are simply shadows of what is presented in the New Testament and the New Covenant and in the person of Christ. All of these things that we will be reading soon in book of Exodus and in the Old Testament all point to Christ. All point to the work of Christ. All 
of the Bible, all of the Word, the Old Testament, the New Testament, it all entirely points to the person and work of Christ. Even when you can not necessarily see Christ explicitly mentioned, we see what is meant to be as shadows pointing to that and pointing to that future would have been the Old Testament, the future person of Christ and him coming and fulfilling those things. Becoming that better sacrifice, dying on the cross for our sins, repaying that debt, being that better and that great high priest again who goes in to the Holy of Holies, presenting that sacrifice, the one-time sacrifice, that being all needed to fulfill and cleanse us of those sins so that we are presented as innocent before the Lord, before God on that day, in that final day as we've studied here in Revelation. So again, it's that idea that says the tabernacle of God is among men, the tabernacle in the Old Testament, again in the book of Exodus, was seen as a sort of portable dwelling place of God as the Israelites traveled around for a long, long time, the tabernacle was seen as the place where God's presence came down and dwelled right there among them, right? But they, they couldn't necessarily, as mere men, go into the presence of God, but it was seen in representing that God is dwelling among them in that way right there and then. Here, Verse 3 says the tabernacle of God is among them and he will dwell among them. God himself will be among them. There will no longer be that veil dividing us from the Holy of Holies. We will have full, full access to God like we've never had before. The deepest level of a relationship that can be achieved with God, that true joy and that true peace. Verse 4, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no longer any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So again, no more tears, no sorrow, no pain, no more death. We see the defeat of death in the end of chapter 20, and here just re bringing up the point again to reemphasize it even more and more that all of those things from the prior world are not present here in this new heaven and in this new earth. Sin is no longer a thing. Satan has been tossed away into the lake of fire along with all of his demons. And his prophet and his peace, they've all been thrown out of the picture, right? Sin is no longer a factor. We have full access to God. It says that there will again, as a result, no more death. We knew that death was the consequence and the penalty for sin. There will be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more grief. There will be nothing but joy and true joy felt in the presence of God. All of the former things are gone and have passed away. Verse 5, And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And praise God that they are. In the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul's writing in chapter 4, it says, you know, verse 8 and 9, he talks about how we are afflicted in every way, not crushed, perplexed, not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, not destroyed, all right? Just the idea that we're being beat and beat and beat, there is pain being felt. Something that we can relate to in this life, right? But he goes on towards the end of that chapter there, in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, he says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, 
yet our inner man is being renewed day by day for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal all of this is temporary all this pain the grief the sorrow the feelings of loss the trials that you're feeling and going through in your workplace whatever situations that you're going through right now it's temporary in light of eternity it will mean nothing in the end we are given that promise that we will get through it that God again makes all things new for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen yet are eternal this is a temporary world it's temporary pain though it may not feel like it now and I'm saying that to myself as well though it may feel like it's just ongoing and never end we are given the promise that it will end that we will spend eternity without all of these former things that these things now that will be former then all these things will be gone we'll be rid of it we will never again have to experience the loss of a loved one we'll never have to experience the crushing feeling you get when you don't get that promotion at work we might not do the best as great as you thought you would on a test whatever that might be whatever stage in life you are in so again he says he makes all things new he is faithful and true and we can trust in that verse 6 then he said to me it is done I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Again, he's saying that it's finished. All of those things, they're done with, they're gone away with. God, he's saying here that he is the beginning and he is the end. Alpha, Omega being the first, last letters of the Greek alphabet. We emphasizing the idea that he is the beginning and the end God is eternal he was there at the beginning he was there before the beginning before our beginning he is here now with us in the situations that we may be in and find ourselves dealing with and he will be there in the future with us and we will have that promised eternal state there of being with him for eternity and experiencing that true communion but again, he says, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Salvation is free, and we do nothing to earn it. And that is the most reassuring idea that I could ever read in my Bible. If it was up to me, I would have zero hope. I promise you I would lose salvation within the next 30 seconds it'd be done I'd have no chance but thanks be to God thanks be to Christ it's not up to me so again the idea is that he those for the person who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost it cost us nothing we simply need to drink from that spring and with the idea of just simply drinking from that spring is the idea of just simply receiving that gift of salvation. Of salvation, We just have to receive it. We don't have to earn it. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. So again, who is it that is referencing here when it says that those who overcome against those the believers... 1 John 5 tells us, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? 
So again, those of us that make that decision to re simply receive that gift of salvation, that we are overcomers, that, that we will inherit this eternity, that we will inherit this new heaven and this new earth. Christ tells his disciples before he leaves that he is going to prepare a place for them. And this is that place right here that we see. So again, those who overcome will inherit these things. I will be his God and he will be my son. Verse 8, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Again, the same idea in the same destination that we saw in the last chapter, chapter 20, in that final judgment of the great white throne and the result in that lake of fire for eternity. And again, I think it's important to, to note as well that it's the second death, that lake of fire, is an eternal judgment just as this is an eternal blessing of this new heaven and this new earth. There is no reality of annihilation as some would hold to. It is an eternal judgment that those that reject God experience. And it's a very heavy idea and thought. But again, I think it gives us in my opinion, all the more reason and all the more motivation to then point people to that spring of the water of life, to point them to Christ to accept that salvation so they don't have to experience such a thing and that they can come and experience this eternal state and eternal communion with God. Verse 9, and here we start to get into more of a description physically of what that new heaven will look like. Verse 9 says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. In verse 10 he says, that, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, to a great and high mountain, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So again, some teachers here um, which, uh, will note that it's not necessarily stated in detail that this heaven lands upon the earth. So some believe that it will orbit that new earth, basically like the moon in a way. Again, that's simply something could accept, take, think, think differently. To me, it's kind of a cool idea, and a cool image. But we see here again that, that New Jerusalem, that holy city, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. Again, right here, just saying that just like a diamond, crystal clear diamond. Verse 12, it had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. So here, as we continue on, we're going to see a lot of mentions of the number 12 here. Um, some will say that 12 is meant to symbolize that government and administration so we could see here and think of it as that perfect rule, eternal rule of God, the administration of God. But again, we see, so a great in high wall, 12 gates. And these 12 gates, it tells us, is meant to represent the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Now, oftentimes, with a misinterpretation of chapter 20, some will come to the conclusion that the church is to replace Israel. Now, 
we hold to a literal translation and a literal reading of the Bible here at Calvary South Dayton. And as we read in that way, in that sense, we will see that that is not the case, that God is not done with the nation of Israel. We see that as we go through the book of Revelation, that the nation of Israel, as his chosen people, is still very much important to God. They are still his chosen people. All right? And so it's important that we remember that as the church, we do not replace them. But Paul dives in in the book of Romans, as we will get to at some point this year, as uh, Pastor Pierce going through the book of Romans on Sunday mornings, we will make our way through chapters 9 through 11. And then in 11, ultimately expressing the idea Paul is telling us there that we do not replace Israel. God is not done with Israel, but we are grafted in like a plant, like a new branch grafted in onto a plant. We are added to that through our faith in Christ. All right. So we see representation of the church here in this chapter, and we see representation of the nation of Israel here in this chapter as well. And it's important to make that distinction. Verse 13, there were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So Peter, James, John, all of those disciples, the apostles of Christ, are here represented as well. All right? As it says that they were represented in the 12 foundation stones. All right? So we see here, again, reemphasizing the idea, reemphasizing the idea, we are grafted in to the nation of Israel through our faith in Christ. We are grafted in. We do not replace them. And our faith is built on the foundation of the apostles. Right? In Ephesians chapter 2, which I want to go to just very briefly. Ephesians chapter 2, verses uh, 19 through 22, says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Old and New Testament, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Right? It says, continues on, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So again, that foundation of the apostles. Well, what is that? Well, as you may know, we are very much um, on the idea that this church is an Acts 2.42 model. Acts 2.42 then says that they, the church, the early church, says that they were continually devoted to the apostles' teaching. Right? So again, the foundations of the apostles is those revelations, the revelation of the word of God and truth that were given to them in writing the scripture of the New Testament. So we, just as it says in Ephesians 2, we have our faith is built on the foundations of the Old Testament and the prophets and the prophecy and teaching that they supply is there in the New Testament of the apostles all right, and the teaching of the doctrine of the Lord and word of God that we see throughout all of Paul's letters in Romans and 1st 2nd Corinthians all of those that he wrote in his time in his ministry we take all those and that is the foundation that is God's word, inspired word the foundation of our faith and what we build our faith on and what we study as we continue to grow in his word and in our faith and relationship and communion with Christ. But again, the idea that we take the Old Testament and the New Testament, that we are not just simply a New Testament church, we do not just simply teach and study the letters of Paul. I am familiar with churches 
um, though it's never named names that only have ever taught, only ever teach the letters of Paul. That they will never touch Exodus. They will never touch Lamentations, right? But we hold to the idea here that we study the entire Word of God, Genesis to Revelation. So again, the, the 12 foundation stones, 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Verse 15, the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. Verse 16, the city is laid out as a square. All right, now we see here, we're starting to get a really Im- um, good image built to us of what exactly this new Jerusalem looks like. It says, laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width, and he measured the city with the rod. It says that the measurement came out to 1,500 miles, which is quite a lot, and it says its length and width and height are equal. So as a result of this, they say that you can get the idea that it's one big cube, and we're not talk. I'm talking like a massive, massive fixture coming down out of heaven from above as it def- descends upon the earth. Right, 1,500 miles in every direction. Some have done the math and come to the conclusion that this equal to somewhere around 3 billion cubic miles. Quite massive, right? Massive says, um, which is I thought was an interesting fact, 1,500 miles, just to put in perspective, is how long the distance is from Maine, state of Maine, to Florida. Quite a lot. So again, we remember the idea of 3 billion square miles, the moon's surface area is about 14.6 million square miles. So this new Jerusalem will be hovering um, above the earth, this new earth, like the moon, but much, much larger, right? We continue on, it says, verse 17, he measured its wall, 72 yards, according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper. And here we start to see the mention of all these different types of gemstones here, right? So you could follow along and forgive me for my butchering of reading some of these words here. But it says the found, uh, the material of the wall was jasper. So again, diamond, like diamond, that crystal clear transparent, right? We see a lot of that idea mentioned throughout this chapter of the idea of transparency and what is used to build this great city. So the wall was jasper, the city was pure gold like clear glass. Again, the transparency, 19, the foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second, sapphire. The third, uh, chalcedony. We'll say that. The fourth, emerald. Uh, verse 20, the fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, chrysoprase. The eleventh, uh, jacinth. And the twelfth, amethyst. All right? So we see here represented, if you really go and Google or DuckDuckGo, all of these uh, gemstones, you'll see all these different colors and just really get the image. We see, you know, red, um, red, green, yellow, red, orange, diamond, all these different colors, purple for amethyst right here. Well, what is this? Does this image call back to something? Well, as you study this uh, chapter, again, it's the idea of trying to tell us what exactly this new heaven, new earth, this new Jerusalem, what it will look like. Well, as I've mentioned earlier, if you go back and you study the book of Exodus, 
and again as we hold to both the Old Testament and the New Testament if you study the book of Exodus and then you go and study the book of Hebrews right the book of Exodus tells us of the tabernacle it tells us of all the different details of that from the golden lampstand where the sacrifices were made the holy of holies that only the high priest could enter into right it tells us what exactly the measurements are of what that tabernacle physically looked like. The temple was then built later on in years, in years um, gone that we give the image as well, what those temple looked like with that holy of holies as well as a more permanent dwelling of God in his presence. All of these things, as we study the book of Hebrews, tells us they are shadows of something. What are these shadows of? They're shadows of this right here. This new heaven, this new earth, and this new Jerusalem, right? It says in Hebrews chapter 9, I believe it's 23. Let's see here. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23, it says, Therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices and these again it's the copies of these things it's saying that the holy of holies the idea of sacrifice the system of the high priest all of those things the temple the place for worship was all pointing to this it's all a shadow of this pointing to this eternal place that we would come to and spending eternity with God. Right? As we go down here, we will see in the next few verses that there's no temple in this place, though. Which is quite interesting. But again, you, as you read the book of Hebrews, it tells us that the temple and those things, um, and that system was founded and built upon these images here as God showed them and revealed to them in the book of Exodus. So again, verse 21 says, The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Again, coming back to that transparency idea. Well, what can we take from all of these mentions in this long list of all these different gemstones? All of these gemstones, all of this material is what God has used to build his new city, New Jerusalem. Well, what does that tell us here, right? We are told of the streets of gold, the walls and these foundations that are foundation stones made of everything from jasper, sardonyx, diamonds, gold, all of these things that are seen as just of immense value in this world. Whereas in this new heaven and new earth, God simply uses it to build the buildings and build his city with, right? We don't travel down the road, I-75, and think, man, that's some really nice asphalt, right? You're not doing that as you're going down. But I think that also points to the idea as we read this description, we aren't necessarily going to be walking down the streets of gold and just constantly staring down under our feet and man, like, that's a really nice pretty road. Like, look at that gold. I think the idea that we can gather from this here is that our desires and our ideas of what we value are going to be far different in this new heaven and this new earth, right? We will be in an eternal state in the presence of God. There is nothing more valuable than that right there. All of these things that we hold dear in this world that are seen of such absolute value, the things that are chased after, the things that wars are fought over, those will mean nothing. They mean absolutely nothing in this new world, in this eternal new world. It says 22, verse 22 here, 
I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Again, going back to the idea that there is no holy of holies of where that veil is dividing our access to God. Everywhere is holy here in this place. The presence of God is everywhere. The, the presence of God, as it states in the beginning of this chapter, God dwells among his people here. That we will have full eternal access to him all the time and feel his true presence. So again, the idea is like the temple was not removed, but expanded. That all is holy, and that we will experience true and pure worship here. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it in the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. All right. This new Jerusalem that will be hovering above the new earth will basically act as the sun here because it will have the presence of God dwelling among his people in this new city. There will be no need for the sun that we have now. There will be no need for the moon. We will have this new city, this new Jerusalem, hovering above the new earth with the presence of God within it. It is why it's so important to take note when we see these ideas of the pure gold as transparent, crystal clear, the transparent city is built out of all these things so that his glory can shine forth and light everything. We will experience God truly here. It will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Verse 26 and verse 27. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So, again, we see here the contrasting ideas comparison of the two destinations, those final destinations for everyone. We either accept God or we reject God. We either, as C.S. Lewis very famously put, and I think beautifully, we either say to God, thy will be done, or God says to you, your will be done. Meaning, if you reject God, your will is that you have no desire to be with him. You have no desire for him to be in your life. And while it's a sad idea, and it's a sad reality, if you choose in this life that you have no desire for God to be in your life, why on earth would he force you to spend eternity with him? Right? But if you accept God... You can experience this new heaven, this new earth, this new Jerusalem, experience the true, deep, and perfect communion with God. Something that we long for in this life here as believers, as we thirst and drink from that spring of the water of life, right? that we seek in our fellowship with him daily as we walk and try to follow his word to the best of our abilities. That we have the promise and the hope that there will, again, be no more mourning, no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more grief. I believe that this chapter, this book, the Revelation really helps us to refocus Pastor Peter put it beautifully as he taught from the book of Isaiah on Sunday morning. We have a desperate need to refocus right now. And I am just as guilty of often preoccupation, I think the word, um, of having a fascination with politics. I'm guilty of that. And you know, I admit that. But 
as it's often said, politics, I believe it's put, comes downstream of culture. And so we got to look to the culture around us and what is the culture around us? What are they focused on? Ignoring all the politics and the political season and strife and nonsense going on right now, the culture is obsessed with sin. They are not looking for God right now. So as Christians, as believers, we need to be doing our best to point them towards the Lord. As the church, we need to be making sure that we set the culture right here, that we are focusing on God, that we are focusing on his word and focusing on that hope of the eternal state that we will one day be able to spend eternity with him in true comfort and true peace and true joy, true communion. As we refocus on that, that it helps us to refocus in our mission that we are given to spread the gospel and preach it to those around us, loved ones and strangers alike. So with that, Pastor Peter will be back next week and we will close out this great final revelation given to John and what we can have hope in that we will one day spend eternity in. So we praise the Lord for that. Let's go ahead and pray. We'll close and we can be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you give us salvation freely. As it says here in this chapter, Lord, those that thirst can drink from the spring of the water of life that you give to all that seek it. We thank you. That's all we have to do is just simply drink from it. All we have to do is simply receive it. There's nothing that we do to earn it. And that's such a most reassuring promise that you give us. And we thank you right here for this promise of this eternity as believers, Lord, as we seek to honor you and glorify you in our day-to-day as disciples of yours that we have the hope that we will one day be able to spend eternity with you, experiencing that true comfort, joy, peace in your presence fully like we never have before. We thank you for that, Lord. We praise you and pray that be with us as we seek to focus and some of us refocus, um, myself refocus on you, Lord, that we make you that bullseye that everything else in the outer rings just falls away, that it is you and only you as the driving force of our lives that as people look into our lives as believers, that they see that we are all about you unashamedly. So we love you, Lord. We pray for this nation. Pray for this world, knowing that it's just temporary. We long for your eternal kingdom to come. Just praise your name, Lord. Amen.